Hey, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us today, wherever you are um, around the world. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, I am Suzanne Baban. I'm the co-lead of the Case Management Task Force with the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And it's a pleasure for me today to be with you and to be introducing um, this webinar with a focus on information management, data protection, and information sharing. Next slide, please, Kira. So today we're really focusing on the importance of appropriate data protection information sharing practices um, that is highlighted in the child protection minimum standards. This includes a focus on standard five, um, on information management, but then also standard 18 um, with a focus on case management. Both of these standards speak to the importance of appropriate information management and related data protection information sharing practices. There is a clear need in case management when handling sensitive data and sharing parts of it with so many actors working in uh, with so many actors working in collaboration. It has, of course, additional complexities when we're talking about humanitarian crisis. crisis. Um, we know that in order to provide children who are receiving child protection case management with rele relevant services, information needs to be shared as part of the case management process. Some examples of how information is shared, whether it's shared through referral to health, health service providers when a child needs medical care, a gender-based violence actor when a child has both a child protection and a gender-based violence concern, to UNHCR when a best interest assessment is needed to ensure long-term uh, care of a refugee child, or even to a government social worker when the case has a legal dimension. These are just a few examples of information sharing we may need to do through the case management process. And I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with this um, when you do case management. However, sometimes we face a lot of issues um, and hesitance in information sharing, uh, leading to either oversharing information or undersharing, which is not always ensuring the best outcomes for children. So today the focus, next slide please, Kira. So today's focus, we'll be looking at the guidance note and the data protection information sharing protocols, um, which has been a long time coming. And I know many have been waiting for, for the launch of, of the, both the guidelines and information sharing protocols. So we're very happy to be here today to be officially launching um, both the guidance and the sh information sharing protocols. And we will present it today, recognizing that child protection practitioners, so yourselves on this call and many other colleagues as well, working directly with communities um, at many levels are mostly not lawyers, not experts or practitioners in data protection. Um, so everybody needs support to be able to navigate the key mechanisms to ensure that children's data and that of their families is handled in a safe, secure and ethical manner at all times to the very best of our ability. And then the second point is that we want to bring to clarity the need for guidance and supporting tools, which was in informed by a series of consultations that took place with those working closely with children and families and engagements with country teams and national organizations, including the regular support provided to them. Just on a last note to say that these efforts um, to get here today to launch the guidance, to finalize the guidance and the protocols came from really the strengthened commitment and engagement of both UNHCR and UNICEF, who really joined forces together to ensure the strong integration and the perspective of refugee children and, and ensure appropriate considerations for refugee children within both these guidance notes and the, and the protocols. And then this piece of work moved under the umbrella of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, um, specifically within the Case Management Task Force, to ensure a stronger interagency piece so that everybody's aligned when it comes to data protection and information sharing. Um, of course, with UNHCR and UNICEF working closely together with many actors to ensure that these processes have been reflective, reflected in other interagency needs and answered answers all the questions in doing their work. I'll hand over now to Jessica and Marta to, to take us through both the guidance um, and the protocols. 
Thank you so much, Suzanne. And hi, colleagues. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Jessica Stewart Clark. I'm a child protection officer with UNHCR headquarters. And I'm really excited to, to be here and to be launching the guidance note and the accompanying tools. Um, myself and Marta, who will introduce herself shortly, we have uh, been working on this for such a long time and we're thrilled to, to see it going out into the wild to be in use in the field operations. We often joke that we have an honorary law degree after going through all this data protection and legal standard text and we have really worked hard to try and make it um, as applicable and relevant in the field. Uh, so I will pass over to Marta and then we will have a video and an activity. Marta, over to you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I just got a notice about a meeting. Okay, great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. So great to see some familiar faces in the name list and some new faces or names. Um, my name is Marta Passerini and I'm a consultant for UNICEF working on child protection case management and information management for case management in humanitarian action. Um, as Jessica mentioned, we've been working closely together now for a few years on this and other products and are thrilled to be presenting them today. Um, so welcome. Just, um, I know Suzanne just dropped the, the message in the chat as well. Just to remind everyone, just for easiness in terms of us trying to answer questions, there's that Q&A bu button, um, little bubble at the bottom. So do feel free to put any questions there. We'll try and answer them as we go along, um, and but we have some dedicated time at the end to answer questions. Um, so back to Jessica, and thanks again for joining. Great, thanks, Marta. So colleagues, uh, we have got a, a Mentimeter that we would like you to, to join us. So you can um, take, you can use your phone camera or if you have an app on your phone for a QR scanner and scan that uh, this code on the screen. You can also go directly to www.menti.com and type in this code 3472. 8874 and we will also pop that into into the chat for you. Um, if you can join the Mentimeter we have got four questions which are really just for us to get a good sense of who's in the room, uh, a bit of a temperature test and it also informs us as we move forward in providing support on rolling out these tools and implementing them in the field. So I will share my screen um, give me one moment. And Kyra, may I request if you could pop that into the, the chat, the Menti code there. Thank you so much. All right, colleagues, I can see that we've already got some responses coming in. So the question is, what is your role in child protection case management or best interest procedure, a specific form of child protection case management for refugees and asylum seekers? I can already see that we've got a we've got numerous different roles coming up here, child protection coordinator, We've got uh, child protection case management working group coaches, researchers. We've got colleagues working on information management for child protection, among others. Uh, we've got advisors. Super interesting mix. We've also, uh, this morning, in the first round of this uh, webinar, we saw that we also had information management staff. We had database management staff, too. So it's really interesting to see um, all the different types of, of roles or profiles of people who are engaging with data protection and information sharing across the board with regards to case management. Interesting, we have uh, colleagues in training and security, a safety focal point. Uh, we've also got colleagues involved in coordination. So keep it coming, we're super interested to, to see what your role is. And uh, we will also be, be taking on these, these inputs later to look at how we can uh, target and tailor support around the rollout of the data protection information sharing protocol and other tools related. Great. 
Thank you so much. If anyone is having any challenges accessing the Mentimeter, please do, do let me know. And I will move us to our next question. So the next question is, have you ever been involved in developing an information sharing protocol for case management and quite specifically for child protection case management? Um, but of course, if you have been involved in perhaps a multi-sectoral or multi-thematic information sharing protocol, that is certainly relevant. And your options are yes, no, and what is an ISP? And it's absolutely fine if you answer what is it, because that's what this, this webinar is all about. And I can see that we have most colleagues who are responding on the mentee have been involved in the in the development of an information sharing protocol. Um, I think for many, it may be a rather triggering experience, as it certainly was quite complicated and drawn out in the past. And we do hope these new tools will will speed up that process and make it um, easier. And then we've also got a fair proportion of colleagues who haven't yet been involved in developing an information sharing protocol. So you are in exactly the right place because we will talk you through how to use this tool. Fantastic. Okay, keep your answers coming. I'll go to the next one. So are you involved in the collection and sharing of children's personal data for referrals or service provision? And you can answer yes directly, yes indirectly, and not in my current role. This will give us a good sense as well of who's in the room, who we're talking to on the information sharing side of things. Great. Okay, so we've got many colleagues who have been indirectly involved in the collection and sharing of children's personal data, and a couple who, who have been using this for, to, to make uh, referrals. Super interesting. I'll give a few more, a few more seconds, moments, uh, before moving to our last question. Very interesting. Fantastic. Okay, last one. This is a disagree or agree, and we've got four statements, and you just choose to what extent you agree or, or don't agree. Uh, the first statement is data protection is important in information sharing during the implementation of case management. The next statement is I already have the tools I need to safely share children's data in the field. Next one is, I already have the knowledge and skills I need to safely share children's data in the field. And the last statement is, information sharing in case management is an area we need to collectively strengthen. So what do you think? Show us here to what extent you agree or disagree with these statements. And I'll give a little bit more time here to really see how this evolves. Marta, if you have any reflections on what you're seeing as the data is emerging in front of our eyes. It's interesting, guys. Like, I think it's very similar to what we saw this morning in terms of the trends, right? So we had another webinar this morning, as many as 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 many of you may know, to accommodate different time zones. And I see some of the trends are there where I think everybody's strongly agreeing that this is important um, and something we need to strengthen. But we we don't all, we haven't had in the past clarity on the tools and all the necessary tools. So that's great because that's what we're here to address. And Marta, I was just thinking also around the information management for case management module that, that we've been working on. That mm -hmm. might be, be something that could be very supportive to the, to the two middle uh, aspects there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. To come, to come, that's another webinar. 
<laughs> yeah, colleagues, we Marta and I have got a lot going on under this case management task force activity group on information management for, for case management. And that includes the work on the guidance note and the accompanying tools, as well as capacity strengthening tools, like a dedicated module on information management for case management. Um, and linkages to the UNHCR BIP best interest procedure training pack, which now has an information management uh, component integrated within it. Fantastic, colleagues. Thank you so much for participating in the Mentee. If you haven't had a chance yet, please keep going. Um, and we will now, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back to Kyra to play us a video. Now, this video is from four of our, our key contributors, colleagues who have uh, participated in both the development and, well, the conceptualization and development of the, the data protection and information sharing protocol and the, the guidance itself but also uh, from a colleague who has been using the, the new template in the field. So we'll hear from four colleagues and, um, and then we will get into the, the, the content of this webinar where I will take you through what's in this guidance note that we keep talking about and then hand over to Marta who is gonna walk you through that data protection and information sharing protocol template. And of course, then we'll have time for questions and answers. And do put your questions and answers in the Q&A. Um, there's a specific button on your, on your Zoom screen that you can use. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible during the session. So thank you so much. And over to Kyra to play the video. So I'm Kamran, I'm, I'm Child Protection Specialist. Here I'm supporting AOR business, OER functions on the information management and also the child protection uh, sections. The information sharing protocols, I, I truly believe this is uh, uh, instrumental and in the foundations to putting together all the child protection actors. I think this is really important, the role of uh, task force first and then the guidance principle, this information sharing protocol, there are concerns to respecting do no harms uh, principle. Mm -hmm. And of course, the information sharing protocol amongst the, the child protection actors, because we know uh, looking at the sustainability aspect, if the actors, they are here for uh, some are short term, some are might be a little longer, but ultimately the custodian is the government and fortunate part in uh, South Sudan, data protection information sharing protocols. It was uh, prepared, developed and endorsed by the government and the key convening agencies in South Sudan. That was done in 2022. And I see the importance of this new version because it also brings the emerging the interoperability uh, to, to work with the, the other key stakeholders, for example, UNICEF. In South Sudan, the UNICEF, they are custodian to uh, deal with the refugees, including the children, those are in the refugee settings. So I see this is really important foundations to bring all those stakeholders together, number one, and also to give them confidence. So the information is going to be secured is the, um, on the principle of do no harm. And it also lay a foundation how to move um, forward. For example, here the service provision rate of survey is really very um, uh, compromised. There is a need to strengthen that area. And I, th I think this uh, together with this ISP and the standard operating um, procedures, so it will guide the all the actors in, under the leadership of a government um, where there are gaps, where there is need to strengthen and then ultimately strengthen the service provisions so that all the vulnerable children, uh, regardless of where in the different settings, they, they should receive appropriate service. That, that's um, the ultimate objective. I'm Mark Schachter. I'm a lawyer at the UNHCR Legal Affairs Service. And in fact, I provided support on legal aspects. For this work, I collaborated with a team of lawyers and data protection experts at UNHCR and at UNICEF. 
and also with other subject experts from these agencies. So I think the DPISP and related guidance can provide a framework that will enable clearer and more efficient collaboration among agencies and NGOs, while also implementing important data protection and privacy safeguards, all in the context of child protection case management. Data protection impact assessments and the DPISP will function as key tools for identifying and managing risks while also ensuring compliance and best practice. In most operational contexts, I think it makes sense to build out a common playbook when there are more than one organizations involved, rather than having to enter into multiple bilateral arrangements and agreements that are not always consistent and that create a risk that basic safeguards won't always be included. So it's intended to be flexible to allow for multiple legal and policy frameworks, but also to set out key core requirements, practices, and commitments that permit proper data sharing in the context of case management. All right, hello. So my name is uh, Laurent Fertuy and I work with uh, UNICEF HQ in the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action team. I am leading the unaccompanied and separated children and case management uh, portfolio. And this is how I got uh, involved uh, in discussion around information sharing uh, around case management. I, I think when we look at uh, child protection in humanitarian action programming, I look at it as a, as a pyramid. We have interventions at the bottom of the pyramid that are reaching very large numbers of kids and families. At the other end of the pyramid, at the top of the pyramid, we have the highly vulnerable children who require individual case management. This is why case management is so fundamental. It is meant to detect uh, the children that are highly vulnerable. It is meant to assess their needs and it is meant to design uh, uh, interventions that uh, address those needs. As part of this work, um, we need to share information amongst actors. It's never one agency uh, employing a, a cadre of uh, uh, social workers addressing all the needs of those highly vulnerable children. Therefore, safely, effectively sharing information on individual cases is fundamental to respond to the range of needs those children are, are experiencing. However, because we are child protection people, because we have the best interest of the child uh, at heart, we are always a little bit nervous about sharing information on individual children. I would even say that in some situations, our anxiety, uh, our concerns about sharing individual information has got in the way of effective case management and effective collaboration amongst agencies. This is why I think providing guidance to country operations as to how to safely share information in the best interest of the child to ensure that the entire range of, of needs are, are covered is, is fundamental. This is why I, I think this work on having a template for DPISP, DPIA, having a guidance note explaining how that needs to be rolled out and adapted at country level is, is so fundamental. So I'm really optimistic and really excited at the idea that we will overcome this anxiety that we've, we've seen, we've observed across child protection agencies and, and ensure that data is shared, data is shared in the best interest of the child, but data is shared in a, in a safe and, and effective manner. I'm Amanda Melville. I'm the Senior Child Protection Officer in UNHCR headquarters, and I was the former head of the Child Protection Unit in DAP. I was involved in the data protection and information sharing protocol and the associated guidance from the very beginning uh, when we started uh, a number of years ago to realize that colleagues in the field were really struggling with being able to know what information should be shared and how it could be shared in a safe and efficient manner. So from our side as UNHCR, we really see uh, and have seen from our field colleagues that in order to protect children, we need to be able to share information in line with their best interests, but in a, an efficient and safe manner. And so we really see that the um, data protection and information sharing template will really help colleagues because we have done the heavy lifting at HQ level together with my colleagues to really develop some standard components of that. So those don't need to 
be negotiated. And those are some of the standard legal clauses. We've also developed some the guidance, which will really simplify and provide guidance to colleagues in the field about what information can be shared and how it can be shared in a safe and appropriate manner. Practically, um, we see that there is a huge need for sharing information in the field, and that information is often shared um, anyway because it's needed to be able to provide um, protection for children uh, that we work with and for. So this really, these tools really help colleagues to to feel confident that they're sharing in line with data protection principles from UNHCR. Obviously, we see the, the benefit of, of, of us being able to share information with partners that could include uh, bio data that we have in progress about the family and the child. It could include the protection risks that we've identified during registration. And for us to be able to share that with our partners so that they don't have to re-ask that information when they're, when they're working on child protection case management is really important. Um, Similarly, it's really important that when uh, child protection partners are working with a, a child, they're able to share information with us. And that information could be things like a change in a care arrangement. It's really important for UNHCR to know that so that we, we ensure that we are able to either you know, trace families if, they're, if uh, children are separated from their families or ensure that children are not unintentionally separated from their existing care arrangements when, when we are doing um, solutions, whether it's return or resettlement. The other example is there may be a service that we're able to provide, whether it's registration of children who have um, to access refugee registration, where we are doing mandate refugee status determination so that children and their families are protected and able to, to access asylum in the country of asylum. Uh, or it may be that, for instance, we're able to provide services such as cash assistance. Um, and so ensuring that that, that information could be shared in a seamless way uh, with us really helps us to provide those kind of services that UNHCR is directly providing to children and ensure that children are able to get that service and they don't fall between the cracks. So obviously for UNHCR, our partnerships with child protection organisations is really crucial. Most of the case management that is done for child protection cases are done by our partners and being able to safely and appropriately share information really is is so important for us. We're also really pleased because I think there we've moved from a period where there was a lot of questions about uh, why sharing information with UNHCR is important, what we can offer partners and how the information that they have is really needed for us and how the, that information can be done in an appropriate way. We've moved, I think, in the last couple of years to a place where we've built a lot of trust and mutual understanding. And, and that trust is built by having things clearly documented, having worked through some of the more complex and sensitive issues, and having spent a lot of time understanding the different perspectives and really coming to a consensus document. And that's why this process has taken us a lot of time, because it was really important that, that this is a truly interagency perspective. Secondly, I think it was a new area for a lot of child protection actors, I mean myself included. I've learned a lot through this process from our data protection colleagues. And I think given that it was a new and complex area, we had to really work across data protection colleagues, child protection experts, um, and also most importantly, and I want to thank the colleagues that were leading this, is that we've really tried to centre this on the field needs. Great, thank you so much, uh, Kyra. Okay, so colleagues, we are going to now dive into uh, uh, into the guidance note. We're going to tell you what is what is this guidance note that we keep going on and on about. Um, Kyra, if I can ask you to put up the the PowerPoint, and I will I will walk you through our interagency guidance note. The guidance note is on data protection and information sharing within child protection case management. And this is applicable to uh, all humanitarian settings. But we have made sure that given, given the reality that increasingly uh, humanitarian action is seeing the increase of mixed settings, that we must 
we, we needed to include and needed to ensure that we made specific consideration around refugee and asylum seeking children. So the guidance note covers all humanitarian settings and has a section uh, which looks at specific considerations for refugees and asylum seekers. Now, the, the guidance note was, was really born from, from questions and concerns that were coming from the field. We had colleagues asking around, when do we need to, to do an information sharing protocol, an ISP? Uh, do we have to do a data protection impact assessment every, every time a new actor joins the response? Um, do we only do information sharing protocols when we're rolling out CPIMS plus? And lots and lots of questions around the, the timing. Who's supposed to lead this process? Who has the authority to sign off? Who has the accountability? And which tools are you supposed to be using? We saw a proliferation in the field of different versions of information sharing protocol templates that were similar but not the same. And therefore, we weren't able to, to verify or validate the consistency around the standard legal clauses that they contained. So, in fact, the, the beginning of this whole story actually comes from the CPIMS Plus Steering Committee. And this is really where we were trying to figure out um, in which setting do you use the CPIMS Plus in humanitarian action or UNHCR's PROGRESS, its tool for information management for, for case management because that tool was broader. It was for registration and refugee protection case management. And it was confusing where were these tools supposed to be used. So we started this process really trying to seek clarity around which information management system do you use where. Marta and myself, under the case management task force, we undertook a, a series of, of country consultations to really dig into what is, what is at the core of, of the issue. And in these consultations with Ethiopia, Kenya, Bangladesh, um, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, as well as receiving feedback from Somalia and Sudan, consulting at the country, regional and global levels in different organizations, it became apparent that the issue was not around which information management system do you use, but much broader on information management for case management and information management for best interest procedure. And a specific area that was causing a lot of confusion and contention was around data protection and information sharing. So the need for, for clarity, the need to, to provide clear guidance on this emerged and to develop accompanying tools such as the new standard global interagency um, template for the data protection and information sharing protocol that Marta will, will walk us all through, as well as another tool, a data protection impact assessment that I will make brief mention to at the end of, of our webinar, which will be forthcoming towards the end of the year. So this guidance note really sets out to address issues um, and uh, to address key considerations around data protection and information sharing, and particularly looks into providing clarity on who leads these processes, when should they happen, and what tools are available to you. So as I've already mentioned, and I won't dwell on the slide uh, too much, but just to be super clear is that the guidance is really not about information management for case management, which is a much broader uh, area with several key components. This is one component within information management for case management. So the guidance note is specific to looking at data protection and information sharing within case management. Um, it's it's actually, it's important, but it's also key to view this guidance note like a cover note, like a, an umbrella for the data protection impact assessment and the data protection information sharing protocol. It's really outlining what, when, who, and how. 
The guidance is not specific to any one information management system. While in these tools, we may make reference to CPIMS Plus or uh, Progress, the child protection module for UNHCR, the information sharing protocol and of course, data protection and information sharing are not uh, confined to the use of one digital tool. The guidance note and these accompanying tools relate to all types of information management for case management, all types of data protection and information sharing. And so that really incorporates digital applications. If you have a collection of digital apps that you're using, offline and paper-based systems. Um, and so it's, it's not specific to one system or another, but rather applying across the board to how we share information in a safe, secure, and ethical way. So the overall purpose of this guidance note is to assist child protection actors. And that's really what this is all about. We're trying to assist our child protection colleagues and practitioners in the field to meet these global standards around data protection and information sharing and also to facilitate coordination processes. We know that uh, formally the, the process of developing information sharing protocols between numerous agencies in protracted situations, as well as in rapid onset situations was really complicated and, and quite unclear about who was supposed to be doing what and unfortunately taking a very long time. Um, and indeed, as, as was mentioned in the video, this can delay the provision of services to children um, and the recognition that as long as we don't have a clear framework in place, people will be sharing information anyways and not necessarily in a safe, secure and ethical way and not necessarily in an accountable way. So the guidance is aiming to, to provide a cover note of how we use that DPISP and that DPIA to meet the needs of children. Um, and it's also about trying to make uh, information sharing more systematic, more efficient, reduce these bottlenecks in, 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 in developing these agreements and reaching an agreement, as well as getting to the point of providing uh, services. We want to ensure that children's data is appropriately collected, processed, stored, shared, and analyzed, that whole life cycle uh, within information management for case management. So inside the, oh, sorry, I went too far. Uh, in, in the uh, guidance note itself, and so uh, we've given you little screenshots on the, on the right-hand side. The guidance note uh, itself is currently being designed and it's the fancy version will be uploaded onto the Alliance webpage. However, you can already access the, the pre-publication version in a Word document, which is already available. This also includes a link to the outcomes document. And the outcomes document is a collation of what we learned from the country consultation. So if you are interested in, in how this all came about, please do have a look at the, at the outcomes document. Um, inside the, the guidance note, we have a section that provides an overview, of course, and really situates what we're doing within um, child protection case management at the interagency and collaboration levels. It lists out key guiding standards and, and principles. And this is really uh, with the intention of making these accessible um, and, and understandable uh, by not legal, not data protection experts, but by child protection practitioners um, and other colleagues who have roles in, in case management. Um, one of the sections we're very excited about is section uh, three, which is all about how these principles actually apply in practice. And this is looking into how do you apply these principles around uh, need to know, do no harm, the best interest of the child, and notably the data protection principles, which have much more legal terminology. Um, how are these applied within the process of sharing information? And that looks at sharing personal data as well as non-personal data. 
And then we have a section which um, I may be a bit biased, but uh, as I work for UNHCR, I'm particularly excited about, which is a section dedicated to specific considerations for refugee and asylum seeking children. And what this is, is looking at is that reciprocal uh, data and information sharing between UNHCR and partners and looking at how we can capitalize on, on the data that these respective entities are collecting and processing within case management. It also uh, lays out more clearly UNHCR's varied roles in terms of being a donor as one role, a coordinator as another, and as a service provider in case management, implementing best interest procedure, as well of, of course the linkages to broader refugee protection case management and related services. So that section, um, really is is key when when there are refugees in the setting in which you are operating it could be a refugee refugee setting it could be a mixed setting um and notably uh in if you are in a setting where there are no refugees you can skip past uh this section as you can within the dpisp template and then um, something that we are really happy to have included in the annexes is a Q&A, or rather a frequently asked questions. And this is actually addressing a lot of those questions that were emerging prior to the development of the guidance document. So you will see specific mention to progress and CPIMS plus featuring in this Q&A. And it is an attempt to really lay out and, and, and provide clarity on some of those questions. We will keep uh, recording uh, frequently asked questions and try to address them through the tools that we, we develop and disseminate. And uh, lastly, just and probably most importantly, is really looking at actually this might be the question that you all have, is inside this guidance note, does it tell us what, when, and who? And it certainly does. It lays out that we have these two key tools for implementing data protection and information sharing in practice. We have a data protection impact assessment, which is like a risk assessment to identify any risks or concerns in data processing and information sharing and to mitigate them. And then of course the information sharing protocol. Um, the data protection impact assessment is not available yet, but will be released in, in the second half of this year. It also details um, when should you have, when should you develop these tools? When should you be implementing them? And normally we say that these should be completed within three months. Um, However, we do recognize that it might not be possible always to conduct a data protection impact assessment in advance of, of completing your information sharing protocol, particularly in rapid onset scenarios. And indeed, in long protracted situations, there may not necessarily be a high requirement for a new data protection impact assessment. So there are accommodations uh, made there. And you can always contextualize and update your information sharing protocol once you have completed that impact assessment. And who's supposed to be leading this process? It falls under the interagency coordination mechanism for child protection in for child protection in your country operation. That could be the AOR or the child protection subworking group or child protection subsector in refugee settings. And of course, it can also be under a locally established case management task force, which includes designated government counterparts and entities. Thank you so much. I know it's a ton of information, but you will have lots of time to look at the document. And without further ado, I will hand over to, to Marta and give Kara back control of her slides. Thank you, colleagues. Over to you, Marta. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you, Kyra, for the support. So we're going to move on to the to the data protection and information sharing protocol, um, also known as DPISP. I will try and not use the acronym um, as much as I can. Um, so as Jessica has introduced, the data protection and information sharing protocol is one of the key tools that we utilize to ensure good data protection and information sharing practices. Usually, 
we recommend that the data protection impact assessment come first, but we have left that template for second and we get asked, but why? And that is because the data protection information sharing protocol actually sets the rule of the game and the standards. And even if you haven't done a data protection impact assessment, what we have in this document right now would be enough for you to ensure appropriate information sharing and data protection. Um, and we'll go through the structure of it and you'll understand hopefully why I'm saying that now. But just to say the development of it and this template specifically, which is quite long and it is, is quite dense, was not just to establish these standards, um, which are actually global standards that we've now applied to child protection case management. It was really to try and facilitate the process. Data protection information sharing protocols were taking a long time. There was a lot of confusion on what could be included, what could, what could, what could be excluded. And this template is set up in a way that there is text text which is recommended you keep and then there's text that you would amend for example revision dates who's been included um, what laws and policies this aligns to um, and then there's also throughout the document of the information sharing protocol which I see now posted in the link so it's already available in a pdf and a word version so you can modify it in this document, there's actual guidance boxes so that you can look at it and receive the guidance and understand how to develop it and apply it in your context. We, of course, will always lend a hand when we're asked um, to support by the coordination mechanisms of different agencies, but we really hope that the guidance that we've built in the document um, will support the application of it and uh, contextualize, contextualization of the protocol in, in your countries. Um, or you know specific locations. Next slide, please. Um, so some key considerations before we look into the details of the protocol. The first one is that it has to be aligned to existing legal frameworks. We're not we're not creating a parallel system. It's been um, developed and designed with the support of our um, legal teams and our data protection. Um, teams on the highest data protection principles, um, global standards, but of course there may be nuances locally that need to be considered, and therefore that is very important. This varies a lot across countries. Data protection is obviously overall a new area for many of us practitioners in humanitarian action to, to, to address um, and look at, but what we've learned with Jessica in the past two years is that countrywide, and even in different regions of different countries, there's quite a difference, but it is important to look at it and understand what those what the, what the legal framework in that country is, noting, noting that the information sharing protocol is an operational procedure, right? It doesn't, it doesn't substitute um, legislation. It's really a procedure to help humanitarian actors understand, based on the legal frameworks, what can and cannot be done in terms of information sharing. Um, so that's the first point. The second one is that the data protection information sharing protocol um, can be used as a bilateral agreement. And but what do we mean by this? Meaning that if in a specific location, initially there's two agencies doing child protection case management, those two agencies can use this agreement and others can then adhere later on. So it can be used bilaterally and then become an interagency tool or it can start as an interagency tool. But this is important because we see in some contexts when there's two agencies that are first um, um, stepping in to provide child protection case management, there's often confusion of whether this tool can be utilized and indeed it can be utilized. There's also agencies who utilize this tool with their own implementing partners. Um, so maybe you are subcontracting local organizations or community groups or even international NGOs and you want something that really stipulates what information they should share outwards, you would look at this, you would you could use the information sharing protocol to set those standards. Um, obviously, as mentioned before, in the legal framework, it's in, in relation to the legal framework, it's important to involve government. Um, um, it, it's it, it, the, the role of government can be quite different in child protection case management um, in humanitarian settings. Sometimes the government will be part of a standard operating procedure and information sharing protocol. Sometimes the government has a different role in terms of the processes, but either way, it's good practice to involve government, uh, make sure they're aware. Um, and even if they cannot be signatories to the information sharing protocol, make sure they're, um, they're aware and understanding of what this is. 
We often get questions around cross-border also. So what happens if we need to share information of children who are moving across borders? Now here, the answer unfortunately is not um, as straightforward as I'd love to say, but what it would require is looking at legal frameworks of the different countries where the children are moving and understanding what data can be shared. Um, and that's quite a complex exercise. Obviously, most agencies do have data protection and legal experts. Um, and Jessica and I also, when we are asked specific questions for certain locations, do defer to our colleagues on this. But it, the template itself could be utilized. But again, that analysis of the legal framework is very important. Now, in the data protection and information sharing protocols, there's different sections and some outline the data points that we can collect and share. What's important, and we'll look at those in a second, is that what we've highlighted is a max. You can reduce those points, but you should never go beyond those. We've built the protocol in a way that it aligns to the best global data protection practices. And we really should not be sharing more information. That's what, what's outlined in the, in, in the protocol. We can reduce it, but really should not be going beyond. And then finally, what we wanted to really highlight is that it has an annex on information security, which was developed with colleagues that are specialized in, in information and communication technology and so on. And um, they really helped us build an annex that talks about paper-based systems, web-based systems, different forms of digital systems. Um, and so, it also set some standards for information security, considering that you know you maybe use any form of information management system. You could be using an Excel sheet, you could be using the Child Protection Information Management System or any other tool. Um, and also, as again, has some um, specifications around paper-based and storing and filing and so on. This, this information um, security annex, and of course, what is listed in a data protection information protocol are a reflection of the upcoming data protection impact assessment. So as agencies um, um, do a data protection impact assessment internally and at the interagency level to look at internal processes, but also contextual specifications, that will be matching the data protection and information sharing protocol. So it should be a quite easy exercise to see how the data protection impact assessment, if at all, um, influences the data protection and information sharing protocol in your context. Um, next slide, please. Now, the objective, as we mentioned before, is um, to ensure appropriate practices for data protection. And by this, we don't mean don't share information. We're saying um, share the appropriate amount of information the right way. Um, and so when we look at information and data protection, we talk about processing, storage, sharing, and destruction of personal and non-personal information. And I'll, 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 I'll explain um, personal and non-personal um, in a little bit. But um, what we have highlighted is a different specific data points for both personal and non-personal information that should be collected and shared. Um, and of course, um, all of this is being done to mitigate any risks on children and their families, um, but at the same time, ensure service provision, which was something that um, was being said, I think, in one of the interviews by Laurent, where he was saying, you know, a lot of the time there's hesitance, but information sharing is important also to ensure service provision. Again, the right amount and the appropriate amount. Um, and so that's what this, this, this data protection and information sharing wants to do. It's not a protocol that's made to limit. It's, it's a protocol that it's, that's meant to create accountability. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the outline, um, and I promise we're almost done because I know this is quite dense. Um, but the, um, the, the first section of, um, so it has six sections and the annex that I was referring to before the information security annex. Um, and you'll see we've color coded them to try and make it a little bit more digestible. And again, you have guidance and text that you can change in the document um, in all the sections. Now the overview and context section um, outlines, um, asks you to outline what is this information sharing protocol about? What country, what geographic limitation, what caseload of children? Um, and also outlines, you know, how has it been developed, which you would obviously adapt, um, there's space for it. Um, who's adhering to it? Um, how long will it be um, in place for until you review it? Um, and, um, you know, what is the process for data breaches? Who is, who is, um, 
who is who is going to be involved in, in in addressing a data breach there's guidance there there's a process where you would discuss it and you would outline who the focal points would be within a coordination mechanism to be able to um uh, speak to a data breach it talks about compliance it talks also about withdrawal if an agency is no longer doing case management what is the process of leaving a data protection information sharing protocol a lot of the text in this version has been already written for you to facilitate your life and it's aligned to good legal practices. But of course, there's a few things that you will need to adapt for your context. The second section is on the key data protection principles. So here we outline and we explain the data, different data protection principles. We talk about do no harm and best interests. And then what are those core data protection principles that we really need to understand. Um, one of them, um, which we like to refer to in the child protection world is need to know, um, is outlined there which it, with its proper data protection legal definition, but then explained and so on. And this is really important because understanding, once you understand the core data protection principles, it's very easy to then think through what you're sharing or what you're receiving. And, and how to safeguard information. Once you've really spent time trying to understand them, everything um, falls into place. However, to try and guide um, all of us who are not data protection and legal experts, um, there are then three sections um, which actually highlight data points. One is on personal data points. So this is the name, um, the sex of the child, the age of the child, the address, you know, mother, father, potentially. Um, so that's a personal data points to be shared. And these usually we share only when, when we do case referrals, because we need to share some, some information of the child on a need to know basis with the service provider to receive that information. This will vary depending um, on, on the case. So for example, a child who has been injured because of um, um, an incidence of violence in the family, if they're referred to a health practitioner um, to address um, a physical um, a physical need, the information shared may be very different than you, you know, that shared with a mental health practitioner, where you might provide additional background because you think that's important for the service provision. So it outlines what you should share, but also guide you in saying, you know, you're not going to always share all the data points. It really depends on what information needs to be um, shared with the service provider for that child to receive the, the services they need. Um, and then there's a section on case transfers. So as we know, when an agency um, is no longer working with a child because their case management programming is, is finishing or the child moves to a different location. So there's another agency working in a different geographic location or um, um, oh, there's a different um, case worker taking on the case. That's when we talk about case transfers. And there you would be sharing more information because you would be handing over that case to someone else. So again, the data points that you would be sharing are listed. And equally for case conferences and best interest determination panels, certain data points are listed. Um, and so there's guidance for you to consider what to share and what not to share to be able to provide those services to the child. So this is about personal data and it's specific to case referrals case transfers and case conferences and BID panels. Now the following two sections, section five, um, sorry, section four and section five, section five are about anonymous aggregate data. This is, this is not data about, that provides any information on the individual child. Um, it's, um, and it's often aggregated. So it's totals, number of boys um, receiving case management, number of girls receiving case management, number of children who are six to 10 receiving case management, number of children who are in a company, number of children who are separated, number of girls who are in a company, number of girls who are separated, separated, um, number of children per type of protection concern, um, be it a vulnerability or be, in an, be it an incident. Um, and so this is your aggregate data. Now here we have specific sections on what data we recommend you share with local authorities and what are the limitations with the child protection coordination mechanism as an agency sharing with the coordination mechanism and also with other sectors and donors. Um, so this helps you advocate with your coordinators and other actors that may be asking for data. And we've listed a number of data points there that and it, the list is pretty long, so there's not a lot of limitations. However, we do have a section around um, sensitive data. 
Um, so we do have anonymous and aggregate data that could be very sensitive in certain contexts. There might be contexts where, you know, sharing that they are LGBTQI plus children um, could put children at risk because of local legislation or children who have been you know, associated and engaged in armed groups and forces um, or, you know, just any type of violation. If you're saying there's five children in this geographic location who have been, you know, um, victims of a specific um, protection you know violation um, and so what the template does it prompts you to think based on your context um, and based on the numbers you collect um, and how you you know the information you're collecting is sharing aggregate data even if it's anonymous risky could it create a risk on certain groups of children um, and and so that's there to remind you and then finally, other than the annex, which is listed at seven, we have um, the section about um, sharing data with UNHCR. And now this is very similar to what Jessica said in the guidance note. The important thing here is that there's a reciprocal um, nature that's outlined. It's not about sharing information with UNHCR. It's about sharing information with the UNHCR and UNHCR sharing information with case management actors when it comes to refugee children and asylum seekers, where you may be doing a best interest determination panel, or there may be other needs that are related to refugee protection um, and information needs to be shared. Now, what's important is that this section does not not align with the rest of the information sharing protocol. The data protection principles in the information sharing protocol are the same and always and are applied based on what is the purpose of sharing information and what is the need and what's the proportionality and did you get consent and assent and so on. So the different data protection principles. And so all um, this section does is confirm and outline that we should be sharing information for all children, including refugee children in an appropriate manner. Um, and the reason we specified this is again, because there was a lot of confusion in the past where you know actors, some actors were using certain IM systems that were being associated with non-refugee children, and then other systems are being used for refugee children. And a lot of agencies were confused, but can we or can we not share um, information since a different information management system, this system you're utilizing is not important. What's important is that you're sharing information in an appropriate and safe way in line with the data protection principles respecting you know, the guidance um, that Jessica presented and the information sharing protocol um, and, and, doing, and doing so for all children. Um, and so um, those are the six key chapters. Um, again, we've tried to make it as user-friendly as um, we, you know, we could. Um, happy to continue receiving feedback, however, um, and, um, and yeah, ha happy, ha happy, to um, support as needed. Next slide, please. Oh, done. I thought there was another one on information sharing protocol, apologies. So this is the acknowledgements, but maybe before I go to the acknowledgements, which are many, because Jessica and I are, are very grateful for all the support we've received in this very long um, process. Um, what I wanted to say about the information sharing protocol, again, is underline that it's there and it's available, and we hope it's as clear as can be. Um, it's, it is a new world for many child protection practitioners. I saw there was a number of IM participants here. So maybe, you know, those who work with information management are more familiar with data protection. Um, but we hope you use it. Um, and just to say, we're not expecting everybody now to go back to their coordination mechanism or organization and say, we need to use this new tool. We want you to use the new tool. Um, but there's, there's no particular rush. What we want to make sure is to, that you know that it exists. So when it's appropriate and you 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 know it's the right time for you to update your information sharing protocols or develop your information sharing protocols if you don't have them, you know this exists um, and you know there's this support. But by means we don't want to create pressure that now everybody has to run, you know, run back and, and update it. Of course, if you think that your current protocols are not aligning to data protection principles and standards please do consider um, going through a revision phase. Um, reach out should you need, should you need any information. Um, the tools are here. And always, always, I tell everyone to start with the guidance note because the guidance note is really a cover note and takes you through the process of what you need to do, the, you know, the what, the where, the who, and so on. And then the data protection information sharing protocol and the data protection and impacts assessment are two tools that help you take, are two tools that help you take you through that process. 
Um, Jessica, before I go to acknowledgements, did you want to add something? No, no, thank you, Marta. I think that's that's good. Great. So acknowledgements, um, just because Jessica and I are incredibly grateful. Other than us having worked on this, we had a number of people from our data protection um, and legal teams. You saw Mark in the video before who was there from the beginning, um, but also others that are mentioned here, um, but also equally from other members of the case management task force. So after UNICEF and um, UNHCR came together to really push for this piece of work, so legal, data protection, you know, ITIM experts and so on. It was also taken to the case management task force and all the different actors at the case management task force also engaged their legal and data protection experts. Um, there were some agencies were particularly committed and gave us a lot of feedback throughout the, um, the process, IRC, PLAN and Save the Children and Charities on Lausanne, who have been champions in, of information management for case management. Um, and before I conclude and we pass the Q&As, there are supporting tools that are being developed, as Jessica said, um, uh, training on information management for case management, which includes a section on data protection and information sharing. We've recently updated the case management guidelines for child protection case management. They're close to finalization. We have a whole brand new chapter on information management for case management there, including clarifications in data protection and information sharing and other things to come. Um, you can always reach out to the case management task force. We can pop the maybe the, the email of the case management task force should you need any additional um, insights or supports or tools that um, you may not be able to access. Um, so that is that on for me on the data protection information sharing protocol. Any any questions? Any additional questions? Um, I'm not sure if in the chat or the Q and A chat box. So Marta, I did see uh, it's been answered in in our Q and A, but I thought it might be relevant to to answering to the to the group. Was a colleague had said, could we clarify uh, this data protection and information sharing protocol? Is it to be used as a guide, or is it to be used as a template or a tool? Um, so in answer to that, um, we 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 think that it can be both. The first thing is, is that the data protection and information sharing protocol, as Marta described, it has a lot of guidance throughout the template, which is literally talking you through how do you fill it out? What do you need to fill out in this uh, section? What should you change? What, what should you not change? And also provides accompanying uh, guidance as you go through the template on, on some of those key considerations. So certainly, even if you have already got an information sharing protocol in your operation, maybe it's been recently developed, you don't necessarily have to rush to developing a new one on the new template. But I would encourage you to read through the, the guidance note and the DPISP template um, and then reflect on if there are any improvements or adjustments or changes that need to be made to your current agreement. And then um, the, the, you'll find online on the Alliance webpage, we have got a PDF version of it. So you can just download that and really use it like a, like a document that you can read, that you can understand what is the information sharing protocol, what are those different components and read in more detail what Marta has taken us through. Um, and then there's a Word version. And the Word document version is the one that you download and you can edit and, and input contextualized information, uh, reflect the specificities of your operational context. What is so important and bears uh, repeating, I know I've said it and Marta, um, is that there, most of the text in the template you don't need to change. Most of the text is standard legal clauses. So you do not need to, I mean, it might look long, uh, but the template we've tried to reduce what you actually have to do on it. So we have uh, provided instructions and we have marked where you actually need to type in any type of information. Some of the examples that Marta provided, for example, is, um, where you have specific contextual considerations around mandatory reporting, um, or if there are uh, specific considerations about uh, reducing the type of information that you're sharing. And so it's indicated for you in the template what you need to change. Don't be afraid by the length. 
and the number of words, uh, there isn't actually a huge amount that you need to contextualize to get this, um, you know, signed. The more important part is the discussion, the agreement, the working together as a coordination group to produce the rules to your club on how you are going to share information and meet the needs of children as your key objective. Marty, do you have anything to add uh, on that? And I'll just check quickly if there are any other questions uh, for us. No, 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 thank, that was great, Jessica. I think that was absolutely comprehensive, but I do see more questions. Yes. Um, Should I read it to you, Marta, the one on the, and then you can, yeah. you can answer. So uh, it would be around how the standard operating procedures could be developed to align with this in specific country operations. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, so I mean, usually you will develop a case management standard operating procedure um, before you, you do an information sharing protocol because a case management standard operating procedure will outline the steps of case management, the legislation around child protection case management, and also, um, you know, who are the children, what's the population, what's the geographic scope, and then the information sharing protocol actually the template refers to the standard operating procedure um, and is is developed based on that. So that's 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 the process. Um, and then so therefore, just like any SOP may be standard in its format, but contextualized, your information sharing protocol will be contextualized to that. Um, so that's 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 my over kind of my overarching um, answer. But yes, while these are global templates, you will do some contextualization. Again, you need to think of the legal framework and you know mandatory reporting in your context and so on. And so there will be contextualization. Um, yeah. Jessica, anything to add? And they're all part of the same. They're all part of the same package, right? Your your information sharing protocol is a companion to your standard operating procedures, and your forms are a companion. Your interagency referral forms or standard forms. These things all go together uh, to to ensure that the way we are working is is accountable. Uh, Marta, there's a new question coming in. Um, and I think this is interesting too. How is the DPISP, um, this template, and maybe the accompanying guidance, addressing the issue of some practitioners or organizations refusing to share information on, on children or information of the children's risks in the name of confidentiality, which denies or delays support for children? Thanks. Um, I mean, I think it's not just a DPISP, but it's a guidance that explains why it's important to share information. If you're not sharing information, the child is most likely not receiving any services because you need to share information for the child to receive, you know, any any sort of service. Not all information of the child, but a certain amount, um, most likely. Um, and um, what we want to do is by promoting the information sharing protocol and rolling out training on information management for case management, really explain that information sharing in line with data protection principles is in the best interest of children. Um, thus, you know, the development of the guidance and of the information sharing protocol. And, you know, this is our first step of bringing it out. There are some country operations that have already reached out and are using some of the updated tools um, because they'd reached out and we told them they were, they were you know, being presented now. But um, the, this is a first step to bring it out to the world. So please, if there is any discussions in country where there's hesitance and in information sharing, do flag it through your coordination mechanisms or through your agencies, to, you know, country offices, regional office, whatever your procedures are. Um, and we're happy to step in and provide support, our, not just Jessica and myself, but there's a number of case management task force um, members who are familiar with this and can support discussions also within, you know, your respective agencies. Um, but um, absolutely, confidentiality um, is not about not sharing information. Confidentiality is about sharing the right amount of information once you get consent or assent from the child and their family and making sure you, 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 um, 
you respect, um, you know, the, the amount of information that needs to be shared on a need to know basis. As we were saying before, confidentiality is one of the key data protection principles and it is explained both in the guidance and the data protection information sharing protocol. Um, and it's not about not sharing, it's about, you know, also making sure the information is stored securely and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, happy, happy to have a more hands-on or, you know, bilateral conversation as needed if there are any um, challenges in any specific context, which is not something we're not familiar with, with Jessica. This is, this is because we, in the past, we, you know, none of us at, who are, uh, none of us, most of us who are child protection practitioners, we're not as aware of the data protection element of this work. Um, it's a new and involving area of work for our sector. Um, it's always been in child protection minimum standards, but obviously there was a number of tools that needed to come and be developed before. But even globally, data protection is, you know, is 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 becoming more important. And it's okay that, you know, we're not familiar with a lot of this, um, but that's why we're here to promote it. Yeah. And Maita, if I may um, also just just add on to the, the the point that you mentioned about, we, you know, we're not unfamiliar with with these types of issues. This is exactly where the the guidance note and the information sharing protocol itself is born from, is from operations raising these, these concerns and these challenges. However, Marta and I and the case management task force members do continue to provide uh, support directly to, to operations at the country level and to the regional level. And what we know and what we can uh, maybe share as, as some wisdom is that so often, if you sit down and you get everyone together to just talk about it um, and give each person the opportunity to share what are their concerns, why do they not want to share this information, it's very likely that they might have anxiety or, or concerns that, that could be well-founded, but it would also can be based on myths. On, on not understanding how um, another person is processing data or not knowing, not knowing, is the information I share with you going to be safe? What are you going to do with it on the other end? So we often need to take actually a much more like, to be honest, loving and forgiving approach when it comes to some of these difficult conversations around, around sharing data because we have the same objective. And we need to harmonize the way that we will work together to make it safe and secure and ethical. And sometimes all it takes is really meeting in the middle and getting to the bottom of what is the fear, what is the concern, and then tackling that jointly, like both dealing with the problem. Um, and as Marta mentioned, as you are, are implementing this field, uh, in the field, if you need advice and support. Um, we do we we do have experience in in overcoming some of these challenges, but you might have a particular issue in your context that can really be supportive um, overall for the child protection practitioners within the alliance and within our agencies. So never hesitate to give us feedback or if there's a really complicated issue that the ISP and the guidance note is not addressing, might be something that we need to work on further. Marta, I can see we've got a question for UNICEF coming in. Um, do you want to have a look? Oh, sorry, Marta, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, there's also one in the chat that's not in the Q&A. So, um, I, yeah, Brian, I hope I'm saying the name correctly. I see your question. I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the toolkit on approaches for sensitization. So um, forgive me. Um, I don't know if I, I'm assuming that sensitization may not may be more broad scheme. Um, I'm assuming. Um, but I having considered that this tool has gone through revision by both the legal team at UNICEF and the data protection team, I'm assuming it's, you know, it's aligned to our, all our, all our protocols and principles internally at UNICEF. However, if you do have a link to that toolkit, please do share it. And I'm happy to look at it and, you know, and compare the two. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Um, and then I see the question from Leslie around whether this is endorsed by the UN. This is 
Um, indeed, endorsed by the UN, it's been developed by UNICEF and UNHCR, and it has been endorsed by the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action and the Case Management Task Force members um, of the Alliance. Um, so absolutely endorsed by our agencies. Um, no, the end user of the data, the, the only person who would see the data is a caseworker who works with that child. This is about sharing um, cer certain types of data for service provision or, you know, for monitoring and programming um, when we're talking about aggregate, you know, anonymous data. But definitely there's no, not one end user. Um, actually, I'd say the only data subject is the child and the child is the one who has the highest level of rights when it comes to his or her data rights, right? So, um, yeah, but it's interagency, so many users, many end users, um, um, and many different ways the information can flow. Jessica, anything you want to add? I just realized that I was typing into the into the oh, chat thanks. and seeing it in the wrong in the wrong place. But I was just uh, writing uh, writing back to to Leslie uh, in the chat who was asking that question around the protocol being endorsed. And as you mentioned, it was co-developed by UNHCR and UNICEF, and under the alliance, it has been endorsed. Um, also, what Marta was uh, talking about in some detail earlier was the data protection and legal experts from these organizations that really supported. So we had lawyers involved to, to comb through what we, what we were looking to write and also helping us put it in the right language, frankly, um, and guiding us. So it has gone through a legal review um, and, and is accordingly endorsed. Um, and I think, Maita, I can't see any any other further questions. So I think that means that we did an excellent job. Um, maybe just to say thank you so much to, to all the participants. Um, and really, you, you must know that this, this is born from you, from the child protection actors. It was you who initiated this. It was you who participated in the consultations and the drafting and our case management task force colleagues for their enduring patience in a long process. We really hope that this will be relevant and applicable to you in the field. We believe it will be. Um, and we look forward to rolling out the data protection impact assessment in the coming months. Keep your eyes peeled for the fancy version of the guidance notes. Um, and yeah, from my side, that's it. Uh, back to you, Marta, and then to, to Suzanne. Nope, just echoing your thank you. Um, and maybe, Suzanne, not sure if you want to wrap up and say a couple words before we close. Sure. Thank you very much, Marta and Jessica, for this very informative webinar. We really hope that was useful for everybody on the call. And I'm sure um, we are ready to support. And I think Kira has dropped in the case management task force um, uh, email. We'll make sure to drop that again. So please do reach out if you have any further questions or support is needed. We are on standby and ready to support the full uh, the full rollout of, of these uh, very important pieces of work moving forward. So thank you again, Marta and Jessica, for all your hard work and effort that you put into this. I know everybody has been very impatiently waiting for these pieces of work. So we're very happy to finally see them online and accessible to all. Um, and thank you everybody for, for joining today and for your active participation and, and for, for all the great questions that you had um, in today's webinar. Thanks everybody.